if you remember in 2019, I did give you a decent presentation of some of the terrestrials that we have found over the years. This one is just more of a touch up over for the new orchids that we have found over the last two years. And of course, you will see some of the unique finds that we have found. So pretty well summed that up quite nicely. Okay, so let's get into the new finds. Now, whoever put this name, I hate you. So I'm just going to call it the little pelican orchid. So you only see this guy in June and July down at a Maiponga. This was the only one that we actually found open. Unfortunately, it wasn't me who found it. So it's a, it's a very gorgeous and very unique little corobus. So it's quite exciting to at least find one. Good old the cinnamon bells, commonly known as the potato orchid, October through to December. This one actually had a very nice, rich cinnamon smell, reminding me of Diurus palustris. So typically you will find these guys at the Kaipo Forest Reserve. So funnily enough, this one was just pretty well standing right in front of me. So sometimes you just got to look where you're about to step and hey, there's an orchid right in front of you. Only a handful of these guys were observed last year. And there's just the inside of them. Not a really, not a really exciting looking orchid, but certainly unique nonetheless. Terrestolus parsonus, this was a new one for us. The glossy or the limestone banded greenhood. You can pretty well tell because of, look how glossy it looks. Generally, you see about 10 flowers. We saw a fair few of these guys out in the Mali areas. And as you can see, they are pretty well widespread. And it can be confused with Viriosa, but there is a bit of a difference. As we can see, Viriosa on the left-hand side, more of the yellow tongue with a dark brown stripe compared to pretty well the contrast of green and a dark green stripe. So that's why I always know, knowing your variations is a handy thing, especially where you're looking as well, because they will differ in locations. Terrastylus mutisa, the mountain shell, July through to September. There were absolutely tons of these in 2020, but numbers were down this year, very likely due to the dry conditions. Very good flowering count on these guys. And despite that they grow in some of the most poorest conditions, they certainly do deliver when they want to. So there, and these, there are absolutely plenty of these out there. Just got to be careful where you're walking because they're only about five to 10 centimetres in height. Terrastylus calicalis, the limestone tiny shell. July and September, these guys will be out. Again, very small, so you do got to be careful where you are walking so you don't tread on these guys. The problem also is that they're very good at camouflaging within the grasses. So if, it's, if they're out in the middle of a sandy pit, they're pretty easy to find. But if there's a lot of low-lying weeds, it does get a bit tricky. So again, these guys are very well conserved. Only the Murraylands and the Yorks, you will actually find these guys. And this is what I mean by how tiny. This was about six centimetres in height. And they also look good when they clump together. This is where they're most easy to find. So these guys just weren't out about another two to three days, they would be popping open. Terrastylus arenicola, the sand hill rufus hood. The reason is because where we found them is on a sandy hill. Up to 25 centimetres in spike, but usually about the 10 to 15 centimetre mark, depending on the rainfall you get. If it's a good wet year, taller spikes, crap year, smaller. They are vulnerable, unfortunately, which is like a lot of these roofer groups, which is a shame because they are one of the most unique types of the terrestrialis family. 
This is what I mean by small. So again, one of the most harshest climates growing, pretty or sand, very little nutrients, holds very little moisture, and they are pretty well quite happy. This is one of my favorites, Caledini Intuta, the ghost spider orchid. Now, whether it's because this is found in a cemetery, you be the judge. July to September, generally one on per spike, but we did get lucky we found a few twos, up to about 20 centimeters in height. You can't really miss these guys because they stand out quite well against the, the grasses. Unfortunately, they are on the endangered side of things and only found on the York Peninsula. So hopefully some native pollinators will help get these numbers back up and running pretty soon because it will be a real shame to lose something like this. It's just a bit of a close-up. It does look a bit like rigid up too. An absolutely stunning white. A new one for us as well is Brumalis, commonly known as the winter spider, and it's usually the first of the spiders to come out with tentaculata being the last. One to two flowers, generally the one. They usually grow to about 30 centimetres in height, otherwise generally about 20 centimetres. But because it was a dry year in 2019 and leading into 2020, their flowering was quite stunted. So while we were trying to look for decent sized spikes, we had to be looking a lot closer to the ground. Unfortunately as well, they are on the vulnerable side of things. They are quite rare to be found on the southern side of the CBD, but you're more likely to find them on the York Peninsula areas. Quite a nice side profile. So as you can see, that's pretty well how high they actually were. Next is Prassi odolatum commonly known as the scented leek, and it does have a nice sweet fragrance. So if you're ever around the southern parts, Meningi Way especially, and you see this guy, definitely put your nose in because it, you will be greeted with a very nice sweet smell. Generally 15 to 20 flowers per spike, 10 to, around, 10 to 60 centimetres in height, generally about that 40 centimetre mark. They do love to grow around the coastal heath areas, and they're not really phase of what soil they grow in. And of course, they are quite widespread as well, which is good news. And there's a nice close up. Caledonia stricta, the stiff spider or good. This guy will be out now. Generally, you only find just the one. We are still yet to find a two up to about 30 centimetres in height, and they do love the mallee and, of course, the broom bush. Sandy and woodland soils is their preferred. Of course, they are quite widespread. They are similar to varicosa because varicosa actually has the yellow clubs, but with this one, we can see a fair bit of raised on the actual labellum itself. So that's a bit of the difference. Varicosa is actually smooth, stricter is raised. Plenty of these around Ferris McDonald's and the Monado Conservation Parks as well. And I mean plenty. Can't miss them. The Holy Grail, Caledonia argocala, the white beauty spider. Mid-September through to early November, so it won't be long before he opens up. Unfortunately, this is pretty well critically endangered. So hopefully a fair bit of work is being done to help preserve this one because it is an absolute stunning orchid. Woodland areas is pretty well the only way you'll find them. And they do have a tall spike too, up to about 60 centimetres in height, generally about that 40 to 50 mark. They do prefer a wet year as well. It's just a side profile. I'm just glad because I found, I found this one. This is one of my favourites, followed by Grandiflora, is Epitactoides, the metallic sun, late August through to early October. Of course, you've got to get the right day. If you get a cooler day, they're not really going to open. 
get around that 24, 25 degree or higher, you're going to be lucky. So this one, there was about 10 or so plants within the area, growing in some of the most hardest conditions, but they were quite happy there. So this one was probably one of the better color forms of it. Not so much rich in the metallic way, but certainly some very unique veining. And of course you do get a bit of color variation as we can see, a bit more to your metallic like, but very strong, vivid striping on the left and not as much on the right hand side. So while some of these plants were looking pretty scrappy, they still put on a decent little display. This one's a new one, Mega Clapchiria, I believe. Some of these names are weird, I'll give you that. But we'll call it the scented or the dryland sun orchid. The reason this one grows in pretty well very dry conditions, you're more likely to find it in the Murrayland areas. And if you do see this one, definitely get your nose in it. Again, it's a very nice, sweet fragrance. These guys can also be found as far north as Lee Creek, believe it or not. So a place that gets absolutely stuff all rain and is quite dry and very arid, these guys will actually be quite happy. So they do like the terra rosa soils and preferably fertile sandstone. The colors do range a bit. You get your deep blues through to purple mauves. So this is more of your typical color. And this one's just a very well nice fawn one. You can see the really nice blushing, especially with the rich blue moving within the actual purple and quite glistening too. Thelomitra flexuosa, the small yellow zigzag, late September through to early November. So these guys will just be about to start opening up on the warmer days. They are quite small, so they can be tricky to miss, especially if they are surrounded by other yellow flowers. So when they're on their own, pretty easy. Unfortunately, they are actually on the, the rare side of things, not so much endangered, but they are a bit they are a challenge to find. If you can, the best way to find them is to find swampy and low-lying areas where moisture tends to pull the most. Thelomitra abiflora should be really called the I don't want to open orchid because this, no matter how many times we see this one, very rarely do we actually see one open. So the small white sun orchid, again, we'll be starting to get to that time of year where these guys will start to open. They do like the woodland and clay soils and pretty well they are everywhere right across the mountain lofty ranges, but do become rare the further north and west you travel. And it's just another one popping up. Similar to Rubra is Thelomitra lidiocilium, the early pink sun orchid. And this one is out now. Some of you guys might have actually seen this on the field trip over the weekend. Generally one to four flowers per spike. They pretty well grow everywhere. Although they're a bit of a, a unique one because if they grow in clay, it's usually drier in elevations. If it's growing in your sandy loams, then obviously it's going to be quite damp, especially here on the plains. They are more of a pale pink compared to the richer pink that we see in Rubra. And there is actually a comparison photo coming up. Again, you do need those very warm days for these guys to open up. But when we went to Aldinga today, it was about 21 degrees, fully overcast, and these were just trying to open. So as you can see, very similar differences. But with, when it comes to Rubra, we can see far thicker petals and a richer pink compared to Ludiocilium, which is slightly narrow and more on the pale side. At first, we actually thought it was just a very pale rubra until we had a closer look and managed to match it. So now we will look into the exquisite, unique, and the other finds that we have found over the years. Starting off with a very nice, well-colored and formed Diurus orientis. There are absolutely plenty of these out there at the moment. This is probably one of the most dominant orchids a lot of you would have seen if you went on the field trip. 
And of course, along Humbug Scrub Road, you would have actually seen similar scenes like this. So while 2020 wasn't the best flowering forum, this year certainly was far better. A unique one for us was the green, a pure green form of Pterostylus pedunculata found near the Mount Crawford area. Very, very tricky to actually see, but this one we believe was found by coincidence because we had someone, had a few people coming in the opposite direction because it was very narrow on the track. We decided to move off to the side and then just had a bit of a look and there they were. So sometimes things just happen by coincidence. Quite a small, cute patch of dwarf Pterostylus nana, the Mali form. So this was taken at Ferris McDonald. So as you can see, very, very small. Average of about three to five centimetres in height. But usually about the 10 to 12 centimetres. So a very little cute population. You might remember that we had a that we are monitoring a patch of robusta up at Parawira. Funny how things can go. In 2018, we had 15. The following year, we had around 60. Last year, we had about 100. This year, one. It's funny how the seasons go. Because originally, we would have thought that 2020 would be lower, but no, it decided to give us a surprise. But it was this year that they decided to fully go to sleep. So that's just how varying the seasons can be. So only God knows what will happen next year. Could be just as bad. There could be none, or there could be a nice amount. So you got to got to count your chickens sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Yeah, they were pretty well all the same size. That... Yeah. But there is in this patch also, there's a lot of new smaller rosettes coming as well. So over time, that'll be a very nice mother load patch. A very nice form, Dolicocyla, probably one of the richer browns that we have seen. We are trying to find Erythroconcum, but for some reason, it keeps evading us but we'll find you one day. Now your first spot, you might, if you were lucky, you might have actually seen the orange form of Diaspirii. Now the projector doesn't really capture the color all that well, which seems to be a major, not much of a major issue, but if you do, if you ever, if you did see it, you count yourself lucky because there's only about two plant, two or three plants in one little spot. So it goes and shows that you do get a few slight color variations compared to your standard yellow. Ah, good old dwarf, aren't they cute? So good old little sanguini, their average height is 20 to 30 centimeters in height with multiple flowers. Uh, because the male had suffered a significantly dry period, it did stunt a lot of growths. Of course, when the growth gets stunted, so do the flowering. So a little neighbouring nana next to him. One thing that was certainly on the quieter side of things this year was the Caledonia capillatas at Ferris. So it was very nice to find last year a double flower and, of course, a triple flower. Certainly one of my favourites when it comes to the spiders. There's just something about them that's so unique. When we talk about rock orchids, you know, we would think like kingy anums and of course the speciations, but what about terrestrials? Well, it's not really growing on rock, but a bit of seed fell from further up the hill and actually landed quite happily just near this rock. And of course, where the seed lands, if the conditions are perfect, it's obviously going to grow. So you can see plenty of moisture is around because we can see plenty of moss starting to grow on the rock as well as on the side as well. So quite, quite a happy little sanguine there. And 
almost yellow. There was a touch of orange in it, so we just couldn't classify it as a pure yellow, but a nice little yellow form of palustris. We have found almost a yellow form of orientus as well. And again, if you see these guys, put your nose in and you have a nice whiff of cinnamon. Yeah, there's always one crazy lot in the mix when it comes to sibling photos. One takes it seriously and one has to goof off. It's just like this. Uh, this one here is the, the hybrid of Pardina and Burii. A nice little clump of Caledonia birii. There was about 36 flowering in this little area. Numbers were reduced this year. As we know, not every year is the same, just like what it is in the orchid house. But it's certainly encouraging to see a lot of flowering of such an endangered species. And of course, plenty of new leaves starting to pop up as well, which of course is very encouraging to see. So it means that not, not the natural pollinators are doing their job seed setting and dispersing, and we are starting to see an increase. A nice little clump of Caledonia cardiochylas. So we all know why they're called cardiochylas, because of their loop, shaped like a heart. Heart in medical terms is cardio, voila. So this one was taken at Ferris McDonald's. There are plenty of these. They do love the sandy profiles. Bit of sheer luck, a nice little insect on a Glossodium major. Despite taking plenty of photos, he did not really move, so he was quite happy there. And it's just like the uh, pollinators when we took Lisa out to, a few weeks ago with all the birria, didn't budge, did they? A pure albiform of Aerocyla species. So this one was found in the Barossa Valley. Just the only one that we found that was a pure alba. We almost found a secondary pure, but there was just a bit too much red to be classified. So this is why I always take your camera wherever you go, because you never know when you're going to find a unique find like this. Bluebeards also make fantastic clumps. They're good on their own, but when they're clumped like this, they are certainly eye-catching and almost nearly impossible to miss when you're walking alongside the track. So it was a bit of a quieter year for them this year, but last year they were quite abundant. So certainly a very nice display. An unusual transparent form of Corybus incurvus. We can see the standard one below, as we can see quite rich with the mauve color but a very nice transparent form. Again, this was taken in the Mount Crawford area. Quite a few of these guys around actually. And we can see that where they are growing, they absolutely love it. Plenty of litter, it's nice and damp, it's protected, it's cool. And of course, that's perfect growing conditions for Coribus. Yep. Yeah, I think it was just around the corner. So this is a, it is an unusual color form of a blue beard. They're usually more of the, uh, the normal blue, bluish purple, but to get almost a nice violet color is certainly unique. Again, the projector doesn't fully capture it as well. It was actually a very tricky one to get with natural light. Usually I'm pretty good with getting purples and all that. And Craig, we know all about catching those colors, don't we? Absolute pains. So that's all of our good old finds. Now I'm going to take you into my world. So last year I actually went to Darwin and across the top end, I did six months, six weeks rather, not six months, I wish, six weeks of thorough storm chasing after two other trips have were actually cancelled thanks to our good old friend COVID. It'd be great when you're gone, or at least well and truly under control. So when it comes to tropical meteorology, it's completely different to the meteorological information, say, down here. So when, when I chase in the Territory, 
Now, how I'm going to explain this is to make sure it's on your level because a lot of this stuff can be quite technical. So it's a really good idea to have reasonable knowledge of your atmosphere of what you're dealing with because each atmosphere, wherever you are in Australia, is going to be different, especially in the tropics. It's such a volatile and unstable atmosphere. So the thunderstorms up there, they pose a far higher risk and danger to people than to say down here. And over time, I will explain why. Thunderstorms in the Territory form very, very quickly. They can go from nothing to a full-blown thunderstorm in less than 20 minutes. And that's because of all that heat and moisture within the lower atmosphere is an absolute starting gun for them. When it comes to chasing out in the field, I had to change my plans a fair few times. Do not rely on Google Maps. I re actually rely on the good old fashioned paper maps because A, they're reliable and they're always there when you need them. The average height of a thunderstorm there can reach as far as 15 kilometres high, possibly even 20 if you get a really strong updraft. You can actually be flying on a plane in a plane you're cruising about 38,000 feet and you can look up and you, see, you actually see the top. So that's how big they are. Not many of them do tend to go under the severe thunderstorm status. So if it produces wind gusts greater than 90, heavy rain, although all the rain there is heavy, but there's a special code for them there. And of course, flash flooding. When it comes to the initial build up, build down and the monsoon, this is where the atmosphere is that it's most unstable. So the starting of the build-up is happening now. So because the air is slightly drier, that actually promotes a lot of evaporative cooling, which helps increase surface winds. So I've got to take you through some of the uh, basic weather maps that I use. So what I tend to use is a low-level shear chart. So this is wind speed just above 250 metres above our heads. So we can see it's all colour coded and it's displayed in knots. We don't use kilometres because knots is pretty well a universal uh, measurement for wind. So we've got all these streamlines. This is the direction of the wind. So if you look around the Darwin area, hopefully the curse, no, the curse will not won't work. But if we look at the actual the lighter bits around here, we can see plenty of westerly winds. So this is actually a sea breeze boundary. This is a really good starting point for thunderstorms. And we can see plenty of easterly winds starting to tilt southeasterly. And we can see where they start to meet around the Pine Creek area. So that's what we call a trough. It's so when two air masses meet. And with air, as soon as it crashes into each other, it can't go through and it can't change direction. It has to go up. So usually when we see a trough, we want to be, and when they're horizontal like this, we want to be on the northern side. When there is a vertical trough, we want to be on the eastern side because that's where you're going to get your most convergence. Another handy tool is what we call a predictive radar. It is accurate to a point, but because when we're dealing with convective setups, which is what the territory is all about, it does hit and miss. So this one was a post-monsoon outbreak. So we had five or six days of just cloud and rain. So very little heating, but because everything was so saturated, small bit of heating and they'll go up quick. So this map was actually pretty accurate, but with that purple blob just to the north of Adelaide River, it was about 40 kilometers too far south. So that's why you just got to take these maps with a grain of salt, but it's a really good predictor. And of course, where to go. Another map that I use is what we call the CAPE or the Convective Available Potential Energy. So it's basically how much energy is in the atmosphere. So it's basically like what we see on all our food, how much, if we eat this amount of cookies, this is how much energy we're going to get. Same principles apply here. So we always like to look at what the energy level is like in the morning. So as we can see here at 9.30, the very encouraging bit is that we're seeing a lot of instability and energy inland. So not much in the way of dry air is going to tamper with anything. 
but we can see as we start getting down to Daly waters and Newcastle waters um, to the south, we've got a lot of drier air. Then we also look at the afternoon. So this is where heating starts to become at its prime. Prime is pretty well about 3.30 to 4.30. So as we can see, still a lot of moisture energy present inland. And this is also a good indicator of where the models believe a thunderstorm is occurring. And that's those drier spots within. We can also see some real rich pockets as well, just to the north of Adelaide River. And that's actually another indication of a strong thunderstorm. One of the handy tools is to get a really good idea of the atmosphere. So this is what we call an atmospheric sounding. It is basically three main components. On the left-hand side, we have our dew point temperature, which is our moisture. On the right-hand side, we have our temperature. And we can see that gray line there. That's what we call the TAP or the theoretical air parcel projection. So on a stable day, that's what the computer models will believe that a parcel of air from the surface will travel. So as it starts to bend back, you can see that nice little gap between the first red line and the gray, that's our energy. As we can see, it stretches right up into the atmosphere. So it's a very good deep layer. And of course, on the right-hand side, that's our wind information displayed in barbs. So a half a barb is five knots, a full bar is 10 knots. So pretty well very light winds throughout. And that's pretty well standard for the tropics. When it comes to the monsoon, all of that will be facing the northwest and it would just be 40 to 60 knots all the way up. And of course, we've got a bit of text there and that's just to help how much, to see how much instability there is. So you can see there's 3,077 joules per kilo of energy, which is quite explosive for thunderstorms. In America, for instance, it can go double that. Got the lifted index, which is a temperature difference between the 800 and the 500, and a few others. The PW or the precipitable water, that's basically if we can, if we saturate all this air to 100% and condense it, we should get about 58 millimetres in that one spot if it stays the same. So this is what a typical day in Darwin starts out. So this is December 26. It's the first main day of sunshine after the monsoon. A good healthy field of cumulus. So the bases are about 2,800 feet. That's actually standard. Any higher from about 3,500, you'd start to get a bit, yeah, something's not right. So this was taken just outside of Nunema, which is about 40 k's to the southeast of Darwin. There was absolutely not a breath of wind. And having a car that's got no air con does get you. So this is our sounding for that particular day. So this is about one o'clock in the afternoon. So sometimes computer models do need our help. So we need to input the customized temperature and the dew point, and that will help modify our sounding. So at the time, we had a temperature of 31.8 degrees at the Nunema weather station and a dew point of 24.7, so very humid. So while some tropical orchids would love that, and while I love that, some people go, I need the air con, or, or others, grab me a cold beer. So we can see plenty of moisture within the low levels. We can tell because the red, two red lines are starting to become quite close. So the further away they are, the drier, closer they are, the more saturated the air is. So we can really see we have cloud bases just below 3,200 feet. And this is pretty well a, a loaded gun sounding. Two hours later, this was a, again a modified sounding. So this is actually what the atmosphere will look like during an actual thunderstorm episode. So we can see we've dropped the temperature down to 23.8 degrees and the dew point is 23. So it is absolutely chucking down. 
We can see the instability level has also dropped significantly from about 3,100 right down to 63. And all the other instability levels have gone down as well because a lot of cold air is actually being dragged from the, from the higher atmosphere right down and it's actually caused a major disturbance. And that's actually what can kill your thunderstorms once they pass maturity. If you want to know what serious rain looks like, this is what it looks like. So take a good look at this photo, especially the power line on the right-hand side and that tree. So this is what, where one tower went up because there was another huge tower going up behind me, but I couldn't see it. So about, this is how quickly it changes. This is what it looked like within one minute. You can barely see that tree. The power line is pretty well hard to see. And it, I was parked on the opposite side of the Nunema Tavern, if anyone's been there. I couldn't even see that. So it's basically a game of where's the tavern. 104 millimetres of rain dumped in a single hour, 45 millimetres within 15 minutes. So imagine what that would do here. We'll have Mount, we'll have Mount Lofty Botanic Gardens in Victoria Square. So this is, this is why I chase. It's a good idea to collect information with which I have my own professional graded weather station to do so. So we can actually see how rapidly it really got going. And we can see where the first tower went up because we can see a nice spike in the rain rate. We peaked about 288 millimetres per hour. So that's impressive. Well, one, of, one of my mates, he, he actually had a real dump and he got about 400 millimetres an hour. So. That's a bit better. It's like a spring shower, yeah, as you said. But you can see it just starts to peter out and ending at 104 millimetres within the hour. So it goes and shows how much moisture can be held in a tropical atmosphere. A few photos to finish it off. So while this does look really mean, and I was expecting about 40 to 45 knot winds, 15 knots. It's really funny how it happens. But Nunama is a great spot for storms to really get going because they're actually starting to come off of a hill. So they're getting a bit of assistance. And with a bit of orographic lifting on the lee side, so that's when we get nice winds coming up, helps lift up a few new towers and pushes them along. So with this cloud feature, it's basically the colder air starting to rush out and as it starts meeting the warm moisture, it condenses and we get these nice space features. And of course, we can see in the, just above all the lower scud, a nice tier. So usually this happens when shear in the mid levels is about 40 knots. You can really get a nice wedding cake tier level if you get the shear perfect. Hector the Convector, it's literally the most reliable thunderstorm in the Northern Territory. It was actually named by pilots during the World War. The reason being is because it sits over the Tiwi Islands and pretty well forms every day at three o'clock. How the Tiwis is formed is basically like a huge pyramid. So you get the sea breeze rushing up and because it cools very quickly because of that additional forcing at the surface, it forms a nice cloud. Hector rarely moves. It will only sit on the Tiwis. So usually on a normal setup, for instance, you would see that and you just think, I'm going to get smashed. It'll just sit there. So it is a very unique little atmosphere in the top end. All right, this is why Northern Territory storms are dangerous far dangerous than your standards. This storm was actually just to the south of Adelaide River and I was about 20 kilometres ahead of it. We can see an absolute huge towering updraft and start, see it starting to precipitate as well. This thing was spitting out lightning 30 kilometres ahead. So this is what we call the clear air bolts. Some others call them the widow makers. 
So with a thunderstorm here in Adelaide, for instance, the lightning is usually about two or three k's just ahead of the rain curtain. With the territory, they'll go where they please. And we believe it's due to the rich iron minerals that is saturated within the soils. And because iron's a really good conductor of electricity, this is your result. There is a fair bit of research going on at the moment. Why storms throw out lightning at such large distances? So it will be good to see some findings in the next few years. And this is that same storm heading straight towards me. So I had to move up a bit more. So this is near the uh, turn off to Bachelor. Again, this one was throwing decent bolts quite ahead of the, uh, the main core itself. So usually when this happens, it's always best to stay in the car because the closest bolt for me with this storm landed just on top of that hill. So it's a good reason why I don't stand under trees. If you can faintly see, you can just see a faint CG or cloud to ground lightning bolt directly within the rain core. Another reason why they are dangerous is what we call the back end of bolts. So these are lightning, this is lightning that's actually happening right at the back of the storm. It's often the most cleanest because there's a fair bit of dry air. The amount of power in these bolts is enormous. The standard amount of current in a single bolt is usually about 30 kiloamps. Some of these bolts were registering some 240,000 amps. So that's enough to power almost a city for a few minutes. So it goes and shows how much power there is. And this is all due to that churning within the atmosphere. But they do make some specky bolts. This one landed about 200 metres in front of me. I've had so many close calls. The closest was just 50 metres. If you ever want to know what lightning sounds like, simply just grab a everyday sparkler and light it up. That crackling is exactly what these guys sound like. So this is heading towards Bino on the, uh, the Cox Peninsula. Terrible service for mobile. So it's, this is where observation chasing does kick in, but it's really tricky when you've got a sky that's pretty well fully gray. So you pretty well, you don't know what's happening. This was my second night in Darwin, which was a nice coastal converging storm. And this is also a really good classic, it's classic sky and to show how unstable Darwin's atmosphere is. If this was in Adelaide, we can see a fair bit of cumulus, what we call towering cumulus, starting to punch up. If that was here, that wouldn't exist because you've got the main cloud above is acting as a lid. So it's not really going to, nothing is really going to get too far. But because there's so much heat and moisture in the air, and because moist air holds a lot more heat than drier air, there's more than enough power and energy to kick them off. And this is another classic. So if you wanted some electrical fried fish, there's your spot. So this is up at Lee Point. Towering is only about 14,000 feet and it's still managed to electrify. So this is a standard monsoon day. So it's always nice to feel a bit of coolness every now and again. But yeah, with these, this one just pretty well sat over the, the harbour itself. Didn't really move, which was a pity because I would have liked to have a nice shower, but what can you do? So this was actually taken using a lightning trigger. So it's an automated trigger that continuously scans the light levels. If it detects a slight change in light, it'll fire the camera. So this is why daytime is so hard unless you have a trigger. So this is what we call a rain-free base. It does take a lot of training and observations to 
fully get the identification right. So the reason why we call this a rain-free base, a bit obvious because there is no rain, but as we can see, we can see a fair bit of low raggedness. So this actually started to rotate. So there was actually a fair bit of tilting within the atmosphere. So what I mean by tilting, it means we were starting to see winds move and change direction. So within about 10 minutes after this photo was taken, there was just a, an absolute huge core of rain. I just missed it by a mere minute. Right, and this is, where, this is what I mean also by skill. You might look at this, and if we look back at the other sounding, we'll think, oh, nothing's going to happen. So how, much, how many of you think nothing's going to happen in this sounding? Mm, some people have been listening. Okay, so this was actually Friday night about two weeks ago when we had a few storms. And if you saw the advertiser Saturday, last Saturday, you would have seen my photo win it. So this actually is a classic mid-level sounding. This is, why we, this is where most of our thunderstorms come from. We have instability. As we can see, we've got a bit of warm air in the lowers, which is warm air evicting, and we could start to see it skewing off to the left. When we see it skew to the left, it's starting to cool. And what this means is that this is, because it's also dry, the parcel of air is going to expand a lot faster than say if there was a lot more moisture within the low levels. And also another setup is if we look at the winds, we have a lot of shear. We have a lot, what we call a low level jet. And we can see between the nine and 800 or the three to 6,500 feet mark, we have a fair bit of strong wind averaging about 45 knots. So this will take that parcel of air from the surface and give it a real kick in the ass and get it up into the atmosphere very, very quickly. It'll expand, it'll cool and condense. And because we have additional shear within the mids, and of course in the uppers, which will act a bit like a vacuum to try and really drag it along, it actually convects and it can actually produce lightning. So it does take a bit of skill to fully read a sounding. So the technical term is a dry adiabatic parcel. And of course, we can see the, the strong low level jet there. And that's the photo that I sent that I got sent to the advertiser and I got paid for. So it's, well, that was really good there. This is a really good example of, of that sounding because we can see a fair bit of the rain starting to fall. As soon as it gets caught within the mid-level jet as well, it starts to skew off. While there wasn't much in the way of rain, a few plinks, they do certainly make fantastic shots for lightning. And this is because we have that dry atmosphere. There's no low cloud to obstruct and you get a quite a lot of leaders. If you get close to a leader, you actually hear them explode. And it's just another one. After this one, that was it. So only a small amount of charge within these clouds, but it's certainly enough to put on an excellent display. And that is all, thank you.